Greetings and welcomes, stranger and friend alike, to my latest and much anticipated Dwarf Fortress Let's Play. Much anticipated by myself, anyway, even if no one else has been anticipating it, though I get an impression that a few people have been waiting on this one. Yes, Dwarf Fortress is finally here. An indie game, though not open source, it is free. Made by Zach and Tarn Adams, as it probably says somewhere on the, here on the screen. There we are. Programmed by Tarn Adams. Toadie won the great. And designed by Tarn and his brother, Zach Adams. Three Toe, the equally great, in my humble opinion. This is Slaves to Armok, God of Blood, Chapter 2, Dwarf Fortress. Histories of cupidity and resourcefulness. That bit changes every time you load the game, and it's usually quite funny. Now, this is a sprawling roguelike. I mean, honestly, at, at this point, I'm not even sure it classes as a roguelike. I think it's become a genre all of its own. But uh, we'll go with calling it a roguelike just for simplicity's sake, really. There are two modes to this game that I'll get to. Well, I'll cover them first before we design a world, but uh, usually you design the world first. The two modes are Adventure Mode, which is a traditional roguelike. It is as roguelike as this game gets in the traditional sense, in that you've got a character in a procedurally generated world with procedural quests. You've got an overworld, an underworld, and everything in between. You go around, you can help people, get people along with you. It, in many ways, it's a fantasy, medieval sort of simulation roguelike, if you like. Kingdoms go to war, there's massive amount of history. I mean, the history itself is procedurally generated, and that's no small thing to boast. There's a, a really vibrant world in which your character can interact with. Now, I will preface this by saying I have not really ever gotten into the adventure mode side of things. I, I, There are plenty of other games that I play that I quite like. Uh, Caves of Curd, uh, NetHack, lots of other roguelikes which are very traditional roguelikes that I go to for my single character dungeon romp desires. Uh, Dwarf Fortress, I come to for the second mode. And it is the, is the mode which it kind of goes after the name, really, Dwarf Fortress, in which you control a fort of dwarves. It starts with seven dwarves, and you go on then to, to build up your fort in for the glory of the mountain homes. This is the game... I, I wouldn't like to put words in the developer's mouth, but for those of you who've seen my uh, Nomoria Let's Play, this is the game that I think it draws the most inspiration from in many ways. Now... I told you about creating a world, and that is what we need to do with any new game of Dwarf Fortress. Now, initially, I wasn't sure about creating the world with you, but in the interest of giving you the full experience, we'll go through this, and this, this episode will just be me setting up the world and probably setting up an expedition into that world. So we'll hit Create New World and see where that takes us. It's going to take a few seconds to bring this up. Now, we don't really need to worry about that too much. Now. We have a very, very great deal of ability to shape this world. And really, you can spend. I could spend several episodes just going through what you could change and how that would affect the, the whole procedural world. Because this will generate a whole world with its histories, with kingdoms that have risen and fallen, kingdoms that have completely been destroyed and that only exist in legend. Legends which the denizens of other kingdoms will reference in their arts and crafts. There, there will be forgotten beasts and mighty heroes whose family lines will be recorded. This, this thing goes into meticulous detail. When I said this was a simulation, I really wasn't kidding. This is probably one of the most in-depth simulations outside of, I don't know, something in NASA to model terraforming on Mars. Now, the first thing you do, choose world size. I, well, you can play with pocket and you can play with enormous. Now, the larger the, the area, the more civilizations you're likely to see, the more history there's going to be there, and the more choices for your forts you're going to have. Whereas playing on a pocket one is going to squeeze a lot more into a much smaller space. And as you can imagine, wars will happen. So th that, can ha that can have a few different effects on the game. If there are a lot of civ civilizations still there, they will probably have a lot of enmity and history with each other. And it'll be a pretty tight, interesting game with a lot of sieges and, and things going on. Or 
one civilization could probably have w wiped out all of the others. It, it can go either way, really. You can either have a really, really diverse, very small area where you're going to kind of, everyone is your neighbor and you've got lots of backstabbing going on and Machiavellian plots. Or you can have very, very non-diverse area where it's just one giant super race is pretty much subjugated everything else or wiped them out. We'll be going for the middle round and just going with medium, just because it's a bit easier. Now, history, this decides how many years the pre-generated history, as it says there. And this is probably the bit that takes the longest time in world generation. Now, just for those who know nothing about this game, you only do this once, typically. You'll make a world, and then you will continue playing in that world. Unlike Nomoria, where every new fort is, is a world all its own in its tiny little bubble, completely unrelated to any other previous fort or, or anything like this. In this, that isn't true. If you've made a fort and it's fallen, not only could you go back and reclaim that with more people from your mountain homes sent out to sort of retake the, the, the old fort, or you might just reference it. Someone who comes along to your new fort might have been the brother of the of some cousin who was, you know, the, the wife of your expedition leader in your past fort. And there will be all sorts of tie-ins like that. Um, the shorter the history, the more crazy the, the world will be. The longer the world has been running, the, and this is perhaps a, a little bit of an observation on real life, is the longer things have been going, the, the less awesome stuff becomes, unfortunately. You know, right in the beginning, they, to, to quote Yati, there could be a, a chocolate dragon behind Everest Sugar Loaf Mountain. Uh, that isn't a direct quote, but it, paraphrasing. Whereas after a while, all of the forgotten beasts and legends have kind of been put to the sword. The, the world is very, very small by then, ironically. Um, so we'll be going to be going somewhere in the middle. Um, I might even go for a short history so that there's lots of mega beasts because you kind of go through different ages, much as we have. Uh, and early on in the ages, there's these titanic beasts and things that are roaming around, devouring people, giant cyclopses, hydras, that sort of thing. As time goes on, the age of heroes, people go out and slay them. Then, I don't know, the age of boringness marched on to the age of capitalism the rise of skyscrapers etc etc we're going to be going for somewhere between 250 years and no year so probably short is a good one number of civilizations i like it to be quite diverse so we're going to have high hopefully there'll be plenty of wars for us to uh loot the spoils of maximum number of sites um this is how many distinct places can exist in the world after generation. Let's leave that on high as well. Now, number of beasts. Increasing this setting makes large beasts more prevalent. So titans, ogres, that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, very high. I like there to be lots of crazy things going on. No, actually, no, we'll put it on high. Because uh, there is a good balance between crazy good and crazy, oh my god, the fort is not going to last for through the first year. Um, natural savagery. Now, there's different kinds of t types of um, difficulty settings of the areas it might might go to. A very savage area might just be wild, or it could be downright, you know, hellish, as in, you know, minions, undead, everything, vampires, liches, demons. Or it could be angelic and, and quite serene, you know, unicorns and, and Jack the forest child and the gump. We'll be going bang smack in the middle because that'll give us a lot of choice. Then, mineral occurrence. Now, this is fairly important. If you go for everywhere, then it's going to be very easy to make pretty much anything you want. You can you can have your silvery halls made of, ironically, copper. Or you could go for very rare, where every time you find iron, is a little mini party goes on. But we're going to be going in the middle ground sparse. And probably that isn't actually too sparse, really, when you think about it. When you see the game, there'll be a decent amount of metals around, but it just won't be crazy but i think that's good enough for our little world here so we're gonna go now it's gonna randomly generate a name so we've got emma kamade or emma kamade the everlasting oh well actually these are region names i'm fairly sure the the human hamlet of oh wow really that's a human name crazy it means the moist hills though whatever it is um or it's in the moist hills now, right now, it's randomly generating the whole world. Um, it'll be making... It's listing how many uh, areas have been rejected, and that's where the randomly generated area didn't quite meet the 
re uh, requirements for an area to be valid. You'll notice all kinds of symbols on the on the map. Now, don't worry about these too much. They, I mean, half of them I don't even recognize, and I've played this game quite a lot in the past. But generally, it's just telling you where the rivers are, where the roads are, where the tunnels have been built between the civilizations. And it's randomly generating these civilizations as we go. As you can see over on the side, we're currently in the Age of Myth, and it's generating the, the world's history. We're up to year 72. It's listing how many historical figures are alive, and this is going up. And that is because people are having children. It's simulating this. It, it's making note of where these families are. And as you can see, the landscape is changing. You'll see like little sites starting up. These are towns that are being formed. These can be subjugated. You can end up with like human peoples who have been brought up in the shadow of goblin tyranny. And they will, they, they will be completely subjugated to slaves. They, they, or you can have children brought up by other races who were kidnapped from their, their actual racial parents and brought up as, I don't know, a flesh-eating elf. And yes, the elves eat flesh. That is their thing. They they, they constantly fight with this. They, they, I often think of the elves in this game as, as like the Eldar from Warhammer 40,000. They, they've kind of got a dark past that they're always at, at war with, always trying to uh, keep away from the, uh, the, the forbidden fruit. Now we're up to year 93, and we've only got a few more years left. We may go through this while I'm, I'm just carrying on talking about the, the game as a whole. If this was 250 years, though, this would take quite a while. And if it was more than that, like the, the 1,050 years, you would be here for about 10 minutes waiting for this to finish. So at that point, yeah, definitely go off and make yourself a cover. But this one's quite close. Now, you can see how many people are dead, and quite a lot of these people will be having, like, um, legends associated to them, or, or just re records of their death. Like, perhaps they were... Uh, the expedition leader or his wife or his children of a town that got crushed by a minotaur that will all be all be recorded and, and later on the person who killed that minotaur will be recorded how many people that minotaur had killed in his reign of terror will be recorded the events as you can see are getting up to staggeringly high levels and each one of these is like a battle that's happened somewhere and i really can't stress enough how much data is generated and stored about this. Uh, it's it's quite crazy that the game runs as well as it does, given that. Though, I will put this out there. Especially in Dwarf Fortress mode, the mode that we're going to be playing, a very long-running, a very successful fortress is subject to gradual and sometimes quite dramatic drops in computer performance over time. Now, that's something that's always been worked on. But uh, if you grab this game, and I strongly recommend that you do, just be aware that sometimes it can get a bit unwieldy and there are usually workarounds and just tips and tricks that you can kind of employ to try and avoid that situation. Quite often it's easier to avoid it than to fix it after the fact. So whilst your first couple of thoughts, I would just say jump in there, maybe check the wiki out, get a little bit of an idea of what you're going to be doing or perhaps even just watch this let's play to see what I do as, as my kind of starting strategy. But otherwise just play it. But if you find that the game is starting to become a bit unplayably slow, don't worry too much. There are ways around that. Now, here we go. Emika Maid, the Everlasting Realms. That's actually a pretty cool name. Has been created. Now, quite often, the uh, names in this game are kind of written in the in the dwarvish language of the game. It's, it's not like tied to anything like Tolkien or anything like that. But uh, I will be making note of that now and then. Now, as you can see, as I'm moving the cursor around, we're seeing all these different names at the top. What, what, hang on, what was that? The Incinerated Land. I thought that said the Incestuous Land for a moment. I was like, hang on a second, that's a bit not good. But uh, the Elven Forest Retreat of Lenuli, the Forest of Releasing. That's pretty cool. But yes, the, this is the land that we've got. Now, you can export this image and have a look at it yourself and you can possibly even find some interesting places to settle but we're just going to go ahead and accept this after i finished having a quick look around Ooh, this area here the purple indicates that it's kind of a, a an unnatural and savage and possibly slightly haunted area some areas are kind of blue right down here this is like the the pole you know, that's why it's all icy blue looking but certain areas will have very very serene surroundings and they'll have a kind of lush blue kind of color I think avatar kind of blue everything is pretty lights and unicorns and animals and things 
But uh, we like this, so we're going to accept. There we go. Now, you can start playing. You can check out a couple of things in here. Legends, for example. I'll very, very briefly touch on this. If we bring up Legends, it's going to start loading the history that we've just got within the game. So, here we go. Historical figures, there are 20,905 of 30,022. So, I imagine that's how many are... No, that couldn't be how many are alive. I don't know. Maybe. Hmm. Sites. How many actual sites are there? Um, artifacts. These are very rare things that have been created. Now, you can create them as in your Dwarven Fortress, and they're very good when you do, especially when you get artifact weapons. They're kind of like masterwork ones in Nomoria, only much better. Masterwork, once you've got fairly well-trained dwarves, is quite common. Artifacts are extremely rare. They're like something that happens from a touch of either insanity or divine inspiration. That sort of level of awesomeness. Regions underground regions because you know you do have people who live underground like the dwarves for example well typically anyway you can live above ground civilizations and other entities structures historical maps i'm not sure what that is and the age of myth now you could look through all of this i'm not going to do that in this one but i do recommend if you play the game check it out because there are some awesome things like you can look at some of the old battles and just see the crazy stuff that was going on there and who was killing what and sometimes it's just fun to find like some of the forgotten beasts or, or like you know, the the ancient you know the creatures uh, the mythological entities like the hydras and stuff like that and just find out how much destruction they did before they were finally put down if they were because they don't have to have been they can still be alive and kicking around in your world. In fact, they can visit your fortress, which is quite often terrifying. So we've got Adventure Mode and Dwarf Fortress Mode. We're going to be going for Dwarf Fortress Mode. Now again, you'll be seeing lots of little pauses when I'm, I'm going through these initial menus. But once you're in the game, it's generally okay. Now there's a lot to look at here. And don't worry, regarding the, um, the character, the font that I'm using here... I've chosen, I think it's called Kutu Curses or something like that. Just for this section, I will be using a tile set most likely when I'm playing the game. But during the character, uh, the world generation and all this, a lot of this is text. And usually the tile sets mess the text up a little bit. So I thought for the world generation, I would just use a, a clean font rather than a tile set just so it's a little bit easier to read now as you can see we've got local region and world on the world you can kind of see what part of the world we're looking at but we're controlling the part in the region that's the part we're moving around and on local is showing us where we would be setting up that large gray area in local is like a town that already exists i think this is probably an elvish settlement looking at the character under the cursor um dwarvish settlement maybe this one and that could be a Dwarvish settlement. But we don't want to settle in a settlement. We want to find a place of our own. And the easiest way to do that is by hitting uh, F to find the desired location. Now, I will be cutting out the part where the, the computer is searching for this. But I'm just going to go over the options. X and Y dimension is how many tiles in the local side of things that you're going to see. Then Y dimension you know same thing savagery low medium high we're not really going to care about savagery evilness now this is what i was talking about with serene and kind of haunted and things like that um again i'm not going to care if it gives us an evil location so be it we'll just have more exclamation mark fun ex exclamation mark when we're playing elevation how mountainous uh, and i usually like that to be about medium temperature i like it to be temperate not too cold not too hot but i like the water to freeze in the winter and i like it to become very hot in the summer uh rain i always want high rain because that's a good way of getting trees uh drainage uh, usually go for low to medium i don't want all the water draining away otherwise you're, you're gonna have an interesting place but if you've got like very low rain you'll probably end up with a desert don't particularly want that Flux stone is necessary to make steel, so I always want that. Aquifer, that can be a pain, a real, real pain, if you don't know how to deal with it. But I actually like the engineering challenge that is usually presented when you've got an aquifer around. So I'm going to say, if I'm going to have one, I'm going to have one. It's fate. So I'm going to leave that NA. River, yes. I want a fresh source of water. That's, that's usually something that's very important. Shallow metal, deep metal, soil, clay. Uh, I do want some clay, but and I do want some soil. Mm. You can kind of 
tell it how thick the soil layer is in your region. Uh, I'm going to leave that at NA. And then you just hit do search. Now, it's going to take a long while for this to find a place. And it's, it's going through measuring everything. But uh, we will be back because I might have to go through this process a few times iterating over what I'm looking for. So we will return when I've actually found somewhere that I like. So see you then. Right, I think I found a spot. I've changed a couple of the parameters to look around. Now, I wanted somewhere that had mountains and somewhere that had forest. So I wanted, because uh, generally you don't find very many trees on a mountain and, and wood is quite important. I think beds can still only be made out of wood. So if you don't have wood, whereas you can make tables and chairs out of stone, not so much beds. So your, your dwarves will very quickly get a bit pissed off. Now, there's a warm area, which is okay. Um, I didn't want anywhere hot because then you don't tend to get cold enough temperatures during winter to freeze water. We've got it's a temp temperate fret, fresh water marsh, so there'll be little pools which you can with fish at the mire of culmination. It is called. Now there are two biomes here. You'll notice down in the bottom. I know it's quite a lot to take in, but you will get used to to looking for the information you need. Now I can press F one if you look in the local area, and that shows that this biome is the mire of culmination. Temperature warm, trees, woodland, so plenty of trees. Other vegetation, moderate, so there's going to be plenty of berry bushes and things that I can I can get seeds from to, to make different types of farms. There are a lot of plant types that you can plant in this. Surroundings calm, so, you know, I generally like some of that's a little bit more crazy than that, but this is one of the best places I was able to find um, for various reasons. There's also a brook, the Passions of Vic, who Vic is and why he's passionate, I don't know. Could be short for Victoria as well. And why she's passionate, I don't know. Perhaps she's passionate for Vic. So we've got a area that doesn't have a civilization right on top of it. Almost all of the other mountainous areas where there were at least some mountains in the starting zone that, that had shown up. Yeah, they didn't... Most of them were like backed right up on top of a town or something. And I generally don't like starting close to other, other civilizations because... Sometimes you'll claim part of their town and it seems a little bit cheap to suddenly own the buildings under your site that you didn't build. I, I prefer to start off a little bit slower than that. Now, we've got shallow clay, deep soil. There's an aquifer, which is basically an underground river, well, an underground lake almost. You can think of it like that. Generally, when there's an aquifer, the aquifer exists on such a large area that it's out you can't just go around it or just keep going far enough and then dig down and you know then tunnel underneath it generally speaking you're going to have to have some engineering project to get that water out of your way so you can build a secure path down the shallow metals and this flux stone now the flux stone and shallow metals are quite important now if we hit f2 you'll notice that this is the the mountainous area now this is the spikes of equity it's a mountain. Its temperature is warm again. There are no trees, like I said, and moderate vegetation, so there are going to be bushes and things. Surroundings calm. Brook, the Passions of Vic, still runs through it. There are deep metals, but no aquifer. So we'll probably try and build the stairs down through the mountainous part and then maybe expand out. Now, one thing to know about this is it, it does have layers and layers and layers, um, somewhat like Nomoria. Uh, again, when I'm comparing it to Nomoria, I understand that I'm fully aware that no, the Nomoria came second, so realistically it's more that Nomoria is like this. But uh, just for the ease of those who've seen Nomoria first on my channel and, and not too familiar with Dwarf Fortress. But you'll have layers, and, and there's almost guaranteed layers uh, of, of certain things. You'll, you'll likely have a cave system underground that when you tap into it, it'll be all sorts of crazy cave plants and cave creatures for that matter. Underground lakes, there'll also be a lava layer almost always and uh, things that I won't spoil even below that. So this looks like a fairly good area for us. Now, there are, is other information you can find. If you hit tab, we can see the neighbours. Uh, the line through it, I believe, means you're at war with them. So there are Dwarven and Elvish and human neighbours. Likely, we're going to be coming from one of the Dwarvish homelands. So we, they, they're automatically going to be friendly with us. But there may be other Dwarvish neighbours here. So these are the races we're likely to encounter. But there's also goblins. And goblins are our enemies. And they will be sieging us once we're of sufficient renown to be worth their time. But even before then, they might send people along to kidnap our children and other lovely things like that. 
Now, this is our civilization area. We can choose from which civilization we come. And if you uh, move through this with the plus and minus keys, you can see where the civilization typically operates. Now, we could be a pioneer for the willful key, for example. We're halfway, well, we're actually most way across the world, depending on which way you go, from their our ancestral homeland. So that would be pretty cool. We're, we're really pushing the boundaries, expanding our kingdom, possibly set it with the uh, intentions of setting up a little bit of a colony over here. The, the uh, excavated tomes, the lances of weight, there's not much difference in what you're going to get. But your home... Um, sort of area will be the best trading partner you have because you'll be able to specifically request things from them each year that they should bring in the next trade caravan that they ca they come with. They're almost guaranteed to show up yearly with a large amount of trade goods. So there is a little bit of strategy in this because again, because this is so simulated on such a low uh, on on deep level. Not every Dorvish civilization has the same trade goods for sale. It depends on where they live. It depends on where your ancestral homelands are, what sort of things they have available to them, what natural resources, and thus what goods they'd have to offer. So there can be a little bit of strategy in this, but I'm not gonna go too much into that. We're just gonna go for vanity's sake on the name and how cool I think it sounds. But uh, I will be kind of keeping an eye on where they are in the overall world and what I'll likely be able to get from them. Because this will also dictate what things we can take on our expedition right from the onset. So we've got the excavated tomes, the lances of weight, the roof of clams, hmm. the puce fortress, <laughs> that sounds awesome. The attic of buds, that sounds even more awesome. The Cave of Tones, the Pillar of Pax, the Mute Wheel, the Steel of Howls, the Rampart of Medicine, the Cremated Furnaces. Wow. And they're actually right there as well. We, I, they're a strong contender. Bejeweled Whimsical Arena. Now that is actually pretty awesome. It's the only non-the kingdom. The Wilful Key, the Mountainous Roof, the Post of Spray. <laughs> That doesn't sound good. And the Canyon of Verses. Now, there are a few there that, that sound pretty cool, but I think we're going to be going with the Cremated Furnaces just because that sounds awesome. Now, at that point, you hit E for Embark. You've selected an area with an aquifer. It might be very difficult to abstain, obtain stone here. It won't be for us, but uh, that's very wise to keep an eye on. It will throw this warning up for you just in case you missed what you were setting up. We're going to be preparing for this journey carefully, as I always do. I don't actually like to start just playing now because it usually just gives you random lots of stuff. Now, there's a lot to this, but uh, I will be cutting the majority of this out. So we've got seven dwarves to start with. This is your set up these are your initial dwarves and you've got 10 points that that's what that 10 is next and you've got 10 points that you can spend on skills now the problem is well you can have 10 skill ups the the higher any particular skill the more points it's going to cost to increase that skill so if you put all i think you can put five points into a skill at most so you can have two skills at, at with five invested into them but that will account for quite a lot of your points which you can see in the bottom right we only have 20 uh, 270. now there's a bunch of stuff you can do you can customize these these dwarves straight off the bat change their names and i will be doing that you can name the group name the fortress i don't think i will be doing that i'm gonna leave the random name generator come up with something interesting for us but the other thing you can do is and this is probably the more important part of it honestly and these are the things that you're going to be taking with you on the right you've got animals that you can bring and on the left you've got items you can bring now i like to spend a fair bit of time modifying this but i'll just go over what you generally start out with naturally you've got some copper picks copper battle axes now in this there's no difference between an axe you used to chop wood and an axe you used to chop heads except that you know, they, they might have varying levels of efficiency in, in, in those particular um, uh, uses. But someone who's good at using an axe to chop wood is probably going to be good at using it to chop heads as well because it'll be training various skills. You've got iron anvils. You can have steel anvils and different sorts of anvils. Dwarven ale, dwarven rum, and dwarven wine. Dwarves like booze. Really like booze. I mean, really like booze. You want booze. You want a lot of booze, otherwise they start to get a bit grouchy. Plump helmet spawn, it's like a, a mushroom. It's a pretty staple food source. 
Pigtail seeds, cave wheat seeds, sweet pod seeds, rock nuts, dimple cup spawn. Now these are cave um cave plants they don't like growing outside so you have to actually make a, a muddied area indoors to grow these particular crops you can get outdoors crops and we probably will in the early early days prepared pond grab a brain yum is all i have to say to that cave lobster um got plump helmets the actual what you get from plump helmet spawn pigtail fiber thread cloth bags ropes alpaca leather quivers Fung, uh, fungi wood buckets, splints, crutches, and wheelbarrows. Now, wheelbarrows are fairly new to me. Um, I'm not actually playing with any world-changing mods because a lot of things have changed since the last time I've actually played the game. We've got mine cards, we've got wheelbarrows, things that actually help your dwarves carry things around. It's going to be great. But uh, I'm not used to that. So there are lots of things that will have changed, like like birds and stuff like that. Um, we can have poultry and things. And I want to have plenty of time to get used to that before I start adding steam guardians and, and robotic spider mounts and, and craziness. But there are mods that can change this game on such a fundamental level. It'll feel like you're playing Skyrim or Fallout or, I don't know, you're living on the backside of an alien planet and you're all greys or thin men any practically anything is possible now as i said i'm going to be doing a lot of customization here and i'm not going to be forcing you to watch that with me so with that said i'm going to pause the recording here and when you return i will have named my peasants i will have selected the items i want to bring and we'll see where that leaves us so see you in a few moments welcome back it has been a little while and I have finished renaming and assigning skills and also changing a few things in here. Now we'll start with the names and the skills first and foremost. We've got Avak Mengrith, the peasant currently, but that will change once I uh, get into the game. I will be using Dwarf Therapist to help manage all the professions and uh, labours. And I'll probably show that off a little bit in the actual uh, gameplay. Now, Avak has a little bit of skill in a lot of leadership-related uh, skills. He's a novice persuader, a novice negotiator, a novice appraiser, organizer, and record keeper. Now, that covers quite a few different specific roles within the fort. He's also a novice conversationalist, a flatterer, a consoler, as in consoling people, um, a pacifier, and a leader. Now... The way that the, the dwarves choose their expedition leader is usually based on who has the better skills for the job and, and a little bit of who likes who. So by giving him this wide spread of skills, hopefully he will become, uh, become the expedition leader. But this is, uh, they, dwarves seem to have a bit of a democracy. They, they, the, the expedition leader or the leader of their the settlement will change from time to time. Um, so, but that hopefully will set us up, at least with someone who can deal with the sort of bookish requirements that a fort has, like, you know, stock check and things like that. And we've got Metasapia, uh, Libash Lectad, the, let's see, what did I set you up as? I think you may, based on your points, be a lumberjack. Yes, you're a woodcutter and a carpenter. Actually, I'll, I'll show you the various... Uh, read out for each person now there will be a little bit of music on this bit i don't know why it stops as soon as i come out of this so but you'll have to get used to that um he's 88 years old born on the 8th of sandstone in the year 38 i won't actually cover this for everyone um but it, this shows you how much depth this game goes into this is all procedurally generated nothing of this is standard there's no templates or anything that from the color of his hair to the style of his hair to anything about his physical or mental state is all randomly generated so his hair is dry his very long sideburns are braided oh that's uh, interesting his very long mustache is arranged in double braids his very long beard is neatly combed ah good he, he takes care of his beard this is a man that uh, deserves my name i think his very long hair is braided he has very broad body he has very low cheekbones his ears are somewhat short his peach skin is wrinkled his hair is straight his hair is burnt sienna with flecks of gray his eyes are amethyst he is susceptible to disease oh that's not so good he likes rock salt, bismuth bronze, clear tourmaline, clear glass, giant nautilus teeth, uh, 
Brown recluse spider silk. Oh, good, he likes spiders, just like me. Gems, leggings, crows for their intelligence, and cave wheat for their stalks. When possible, he prefers to consume koala, cave fish, and longland beer. He absolutely detests brown recluse spiders. Oh, wow, that's, that's a very interesting little setup there. You like the silk, but don't like them? No. You silly avac. He has an iron will, a great feel for social relationships, a great memory, an ability to read emotions fairly well, and a good spatial sense. Now, this is why I made him the leader, is because he has a really good set of traits for dealing with people. And this actually does matter. The bit in green, the dark green, and the bit in red do matter quite a lot. The bit in light green are his likes and dislikes, and they do come into things. If, for example, someone decided to decorate his room with engravings of brown recluse spiders, he would not like that room, even if it was made of gold. Or mithril, well, he'd probably like it if it was made of mithril, even if it was covered in brown recluse spiders. I think he'd learn to live with it, but you get what I mean. And he'll actively enjoy meals that are made of koala or cavefish and he will choose those when he gets the chance. He's confident under pressure, he enjoys the company of others, he isn't given to flights of fancy, he likes to try new things, he is easily moved to pity. Oh, well, I guess actually that's quite like me. He has a sense of duty, uh, very like me as well. He needs alcohol to get through the working day. Wow, this guy is like the exact replica of me in game form. He likes working outdoors and grumbles only mildly at inclement weather. That, that's where this starts to fall apart, because I grumble quite a lot at inclement weather, but for me, inclement weather is when the sun is there. Uh, a short, sturdy creature, fond of drink and industry. Now, that's the full character list. I'm not going to go through all of that for everyone. I'm just going to cover their drawbacks and their positive traits. I'm not even going to cover what they like, but we'll probably get to know our people over time. Now, Metasepia, the woodcutter. She is incredibly quick to heal and almost never sick, but she is very flimsy. She has a great kinesthetic sense, great creativity, and a way with words, but she has a very bad analytical ability, so she wouldn't be very good in, on the books, but pretty good as a, as a craftswoman, and the fact that she's quick to heal and almost is almost never sick means she's, you know, never, hopefully, never not going to need much time with the doctor and will uh, be working throughout the days and nights. Now, Revocane is uh, our doctor, and that's why everyone should really stress not going to the doctor. I've tried to give him some skills, because you do need a, a doctor. It's quite important. Um, he's an adequate wound dresser, diagnostician, surgeon, bone doctor, and suturer. But it's Revocane. And, like all dwarves, he likes to drink. So, yeah, yeah don't, don't get sick. Don't ever get sick. That's all I'm going to say. Revocane is susceptible to disease and very weak, so probably the worst. <laughs> I should have noted that, actually. But I think I think the Doctor was one of the people I did last, so it was, it was a case of who's the best out of who's left for being in that role. But he's got a very good feel for social relationships and a way with words, so he's got a fantastic bedside manner. But he has an iffy memory, little natural inclination towards music, and very bad sense of empathy. Oh, okay, bedside manner out the window. Why did I make this guy the Doctor? I do not know. Oh, actually, it's... It, it's probably as, quite as accurate as far as Revocane being a doctor would be. Next, we've got Evelyn, who is our... Let's see. Let's go down. She's our Miner and Mason. So, Evelyn, she's indefatigable, really sick, tough and agile. Now, this is what makes her a good miner, because miners sometimes get in trouble when they like mine the floor out from underneath themselves or something collapses on them. And also, it's quite a strenuous job. So, the fact that she pretty much never tires, is pretty tough and quite fast on her feet. Good qualities to have in a in a moderately dangerous job like, like mining, which is quite physically demanding. She's got poor empathy and, lift, and a little difficulty with words, so, you know, the fact she spends a lot of her time out mining rocks, you know, she likes the rocks. The rocks don't talk to her and don't expect her to talk to them. She probably does talk to them a little bit, but it doesn't matter. They don't judge her for her little difficulty with words, the, the stumbling over every other word or something like that, or, or the fact that she uses some words in the wrong places, they don't mind. They don't judge her. They're happy with her anyway, and she's happy with that. Now, we've got Plump Helmet, our weaponsmith, armorsmith, metalsmith, furnace operator, and woodburn. Now, this is a really important set of skills, and that's why I put them up to seven so they're adequate. It is spread across quite a few different areas. Um, like, you could get away with just the metalsmith, furnace operator, and woodburner for what I'm setting at this embark to be, but by and large, I wanted all of the others just in case we don't get any migrants with these skills for a while. So let's check out Plump Helmet. 
Plump Helmet is very slow to tire, very agile and tough, so another good physical worker. But he is very weak. Oh, that's not actually that good for a smith. Hmm. Hopefully, he'll get better. And, and these are things that do get better as the dwarves get better at their jobs. They will gradually get better stats. So if he's working out in the forge all day, he'll eventually become strong, hopefully, cross fingers. He has a natural inclination towards a language, but he has a shortage of patience, little willpower, and poor kinesthetic sense. The kinesthetic sense is a bit iffy for a smith, but the, the fact that he's got not much willpower and a shortage of patience, the shortage of patience seems quite fitting, I think, you know. He's, he's uh, salt of the earth, he works with the metal, he has a little, little time for drama, no, no, no. But uh, hopefully those other things won't hold him back too much, the kinesthetic sense and the very weakness. Now we've got Shelab, our brewer, cook, and butcher. She is very rarely sick, which is good, because she's going to be handling meats. We don't want her passing on disease. But she's very slow to heal. That's fine. Hopefully she won't get hurt. She has a good creativity, good memory, a feel for music, and a sum of patience. But she has a questionable spatial sense. Uh, hopefully she takes very great care when she's using the meat cleaver then. Poor focus, little linguistic ability, very bad analytical ability, and a lack of understanding of social relationships. That's fine. She's going to be cutting things up, not talking to them. Hopefully. Perhaps she will talk to them. And that's a little bit morbid. Maybe she'll end up carving amulets out of people's skulls. I don't know. That would be kind of cool. As long as they're artifact amulets. And then finally, we've got Flying Staplers, the Grower Herbalist. Flying Staplers is almost never sick and slow to tire, which is good for a farmer. But she is flimsy, weak, and very slow to heal. Uh, you know, these things are acceptable as a farmer because that's a very low-risk job. She has questionable spatial sense, poor focus, and little patience. Again, quite fitting of a farmer, I feel. Now, let me just make sure I have actually set all the sexes correct. I, I think they are. The, the, the males are male and the females are female. Now, on to this. You will notice, if you've been paying attention, that we no longer have an axe or uh, um, a pickaxe. Wood axe or pickaxe. They're gone. And this is something I often do because they, if you notice, cost quite a bit, like 44 and 68 or something like that. I've replaced them with tetrahedrite, four pieces of tetrahedrite. Now, tetrahedrite, when you smelt it, you can end up with silver and copper, I believe, or possibly a little chance of silver, most likely copper. And you can get oak. I've got oak logs, which we're going to make into charcoal. We're going to build a furnace a smelter and a metalsmith and uh, and a forge sorry out of the granite so these are um fire resistant materials along with the iron anvil then we're going to use the oaks to turn into charcoal which we're then going to use to smelt the tetrahedrite then turn the copper into pickaxes uh, and a battle axe we only need one of each because we've only got one person of each trade and the rest can be used for something else later. And we might even end up with some silver, which is pretty cool. We could turn into a craft or a statue or something for a nice room, maybe the Great Hall. We've got an assortment of meat rather than just prepared pond grabber brain. We've now got turkey meat as well, chinchilla meat, prepared wombat heart, mountain goat sweetbread, and eagle meat. Uh, you know, just to give people a chance to have nice meals, something that they, they like. Got a bit of cable offs, uh, plenty of pump helmets. We've got an increase in the amount of ale, rum, and wine we're bringing along. And over on the side, we have one dog of each type. They're not do war dogs or hunting dogs, but we will train them into that eventually. And then they'll give birth to slightly stronger pups based on what they are. Hunters, I think, are more agile, whereas uh, war dogs are more fierce in combat. And we've got a turkey hen and a turkey gobbler, so that'll help with our poultry. And that is it. Now, wow, it has taken a little while to explain all of this and get through everything, so I hope people haven't been too bored. I did want to cover this all for those who are brand new to the game and i know it can be a little bit overwhelming but hopefully i've explained why i'm doing stuff and where it all come from now based on all this i may uh add things together it may just make one episode to cover all of this make it a bit of a longer episode or i may end up splitting this over two who knows but uh, that is it for our dwarves i will just quickly cover that you can name your group and name your fortress if you hit f you can you can build a name now you don't just type what you want you have to build it um you build the type of name that you've got we're gonna go with the random one which is channeled star a bit elvish really for me my likes i i would have preferred something earthy and metally but uh 
Uh, I, I don't know, like uh, the ancient anvils or, or something like that. But uh, no, that, that'll be okay for a fort name. So I'm not going to change that. But the way you do it is if you wanted to, you'd go through this and you'd select various um, parts of the name. And that would all go into it. And as you can see, in the middle is what the, the dwarvish version of that word is. And on the far right, you've got what type of word it is and, and so on and so forth. You'll notice that above channeled star is the dwarvish name for this fortress, which is Katanvir. Um, we're going to exit out of that. And likewise, you can name your group. So all of our first seven are going to belong to a group, and that will be who are setting up this fortress. And we can have a look at that. It's the Pleated Craft uh, Edistragoth. And again, you can build this name to your liking, but we're going to be going with the randoms. And that is, by and large, everything we need to know about world generation and the initial setup. I am almost likely never going to be doing this again, like in a video. So for the sake of saving time, I'm going to go ahead and save this as a default profile. And this way, whenever I set up the game again, I'm not going to have to spend a bunch of time setting up uh, skills, setting up uh, the things that I want to bring with me. I probably will tweak that in the future, but I'll use this as a template. So this will be template one rather than profile one because I just like to be funny about that sort of stuff. And there we go. Now we hit the big old E for embark. And uh, yeah, wish us luck after it finishes deciding what to do. Here we go. A dwarven outpost. You have arrived. After a journey from the mountain homes into the forbidding wilderness beyond, your harsh trek has finally ended. Your party of seven is to make an outpost for the glory of all of Orshtazvesh, which is the dwarvish name of our, uh, of our greater culture. There are almost no supplies left, but with stout labour comes sustenance, whether by bolt, plough or hook, provide for your dwarves. You are expecting a supply caravan just before winter entombs you, but it is spring now. Enough time to delve secure lodgings ere the dingoes get hungry. A new chapter of dwarven history begins here at this place. Katanvir, Channeled Star, Strike the Earth.